Thank you for joining us today. This is Easy Backgrounds quarterly webinar series. And today we're talking about 2016 hot topics in employment background screening and what you can expect in 2017. And it's being presented by Pamela Devada. Pam is a labor and employment partner at Seifarth Shaw LLP in Chicago, where she leads their nationwide background screening, litigation, and compliance team. As a national authority and the firm's go-to for all issues related to the Fair Credit Reporting Act and background screening compliance, Pam participates regularly in media interviews, speeches, webinars, and training for employers. Pam has also testified before the EEOC regarding the use of credit checks in employment, is a certified Lean Six Sigma Yellow Belt, and was formerly an adjunct professor of legal writing at Chicago Kent College of Law. With that, I'll hand things over to our presenter, Pamela. Thanks so much, Megan, and thanks everyone for being here today. I'm thrilled to be here for Easy Backgrounds and um, to end of the year, if you will, on what happened in 2016 and what we saw in terms of hot topics and uh, implement background screening and what we really are going to look forward to in 2017. Um, a little bit about myself, um, as Megan said, we'll go to the next slide. I'm a labor and employment uh, partner in the Chicago office of Cypher Shaw. I've been practicing law for about 16 years and specialize, really my entire practice deals with counseling employers and consumer reporting agencies and defending class action litigation on the management side for employers and consumer reporting agencies under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, dealing with issues, hiring issues such as the use of criminal and credit history and employment and all the things that are related to uh, pre-employment screening and um, pre-employment evaluation under, um, under most employers' rubric. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, we're going to have a lofty agenda. We're really going to talk about what happened in 2016. Um, there were a lot of new things that happened. Frankly, we were waiting um, quite a bit of time um, before we got into any um, substance, we were waiting quite a bit of time for Spokio, and one of the cases that we're going to be talking about today is how that impacts um, the entire background screening industry. Um, as you just saw, uh, this is an informational webinar only. Nothing herein should be construed as legal advice or counsel on behalf of either Easy Backgrounds or on behalf of um, Cypher Shaw. You can read the disclaimer. So what are we going to cover today? Um, I think number one, um, we've got new litigation trends that we're seeing, um, and we've got a couple of items that we really want to talk to you about um, so that you can prepare yourself for 2017 um, and see what we're, we're going to be dealing with at that house of cards. Obviously, we've got a brand new administration coming in the door, and so we are going to talk a little bit about how um, President-elect Trump is going to potentially impact some of our regulatory agencies like the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, as well as the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. Um, we've seen a lot of the items on this agenda happening um, during the year. And one of the big things that we really saw was a lot of waiting um, until about half of the year was over. And so from May until now, we, we've seen a lot of new decisions come out. We've seen a lot of new legislation come out, and we're going to talk about all of those things. So let's start with litigation of 2015. Go to the next slide. What are we seeing here? We're seeing many new councils involved um, and more litigation than ever. It used to be that the Fair Credit Reporting Act was a, a very little-known statute, and you didn't see a lot of litigation on it. Starting in about 2012, that really changed, and we saw an increase, and it's been substantially increasing ever since. We've seen some of the cases, and we've got some good news because of the Robbins versus Spokio case that we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, has really impacted or potentially will impact what's going to happen in 2017. But we're seeing new plaintiff's counsels come on the bandwagon. One of the reasons is because these are easy claims to bring. They're cut and paste. And they don't take a lot of factual specificity. Um, and there's statutory damages involved, which is the same statutory schema as the Fair Labor Standards Act. And so for those of you who are employers, which is most people on the phone, you'll understand that there's been a huge increase in wage and hour law. That's perhaps the most 
litigation that we see under employment law than any other trend. And we've seen that really being copycatted by these plaintiff counsels who were either formerly wage and hour lawyers or currently wage and hour lawyers and are jumping on the bandwagon. We're also seeing a consolidated information sharing effort. What I mean by that is there are now conferences that people are having and consortiums of plaintiff counsels where they're specifically targeting employers, um, types of employers, but also employers by name. They're giving tips on how to sue employers, what types of claims to look for. Um, they're talking about um, how to get an applicant to go online and apply and what things to look for, for example, disclosure and authorization forms that are given prior to conditional offer that you can just get on the web. And they're going on these fishing expeditions. So there's an, a huge movement, if you will, with regard to the plaintiff's counsels becoming much more sophisticated and sharing much more information. It's certainly not uncommon to see in the lawsuits that we're all dealing with multiple plaintiff's counsels, the three, four, or five names instead of one. They're not infighting. They're sharing information um, and then sharing the spoils of the potential settlements or um, of potential judgments that are, that are coming out. We're also seeing some copycat um, lawsuits. So if you have one lawsuit against you as an employer, for example, for a disclosure form, it's certainly not uncommon to see additional lawsuits being filed. Um, it's lowered since the Robbins versus Spokio case came down, um, and we're going to talk about that impact and why, frankly, that case has had such a, a dramatic impact on the litigation. And frankly, we think it's going to have an even more dramatic impact depending on what happens in the next four to six months with the cases that are currently pending. We're also seeing what I'll call multi-jurisdiction lawsuits and, and forum shopping. What that means is plaintiff counsels are becoming more sophisticated. So when you file a lawsuit, a plaintiff has a choice of where to file the lawsuit. Usually it's where the person lives, but it may be where the person was working if it's in a different location, or it may be where a company is located, depending on the case law that is in that jurisdiction. So we're seeing a lot more litigation being filed in, for example, um, California. We're seeing um, cases less likely to be filed in, in some of the jurisdictions that are becoming more employer-friendly or where there's more lawsuits where we're getting better decisions, like in Ohio. Um, Virginia is a hot topic of litigation, and you see a lot of FCRA decisions coming out of them, that jurisdiction as well. We think the trend of forum shopping will continue. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the difference between federal cases and state cases under the Fair Credit Reporting Act and what that means for you. Um, a lot of it is, is legal um, mumbo-jumbo, if you will, but it's important so that you can understand what your risks are and what are the different topics that you need to be aware of going into the next year um, and we can learn from what happened in 2016. We're also seeing advertising. You may notice that on social media, on Facebook, on even in LinkedIn, sometimes on websites and Craigslist, you see people who are advertising for potential plaintiffs to sue on a class action relief basis. So for example, um, things like, have you ever had a background check run on you? Have you been given a disclosure form when applying for an, an employment position? Um, if so, you may seek monetary um, relief um, if the disclosure form was inaccurate, for example. These types of things we're seeing all the time. And then we're seeing increased disclosure form litigation, and we will talk about that in some more detail. So why does it matter? We'll go to the next slide. Just as a reminder, there's two types of claims that somebody can bring under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. There's negligent noncompliance and willful noncompliance. And generally, we see negligent noncompliance claims in the single plan or individual basis. And what that means is somebody has either been harmed or wronged, allegedly, by not getting a job because something on the background check, when either a background check was um, incorrect, for example, or they believe that um, it wasn't job related, or you have the issue where they didn't get an adverse action, for example, and there was a mistake and they didn't have time to rectify it. Remember, if you will, there are four responsibilities under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. 
um, for an employer. One, they must have a permissible purpose. So you have an employment purpose. Um, that's easy one. Two, you must get a standalone disclosure consisting solely of the disclosure. We're going to talk about that in some detail because those are the biggest crux of the claims that we are seeing under the FCRA, specifically in 2016. Third, you have to follow the two-step adverse action process if you are going to take adverse action in whole or in part on an individual. And then fourth and finally, you must certify or give a promise to the um, CRA, the background screening company, that you are going to get the disclosure, you have a permissible purpose, you are going to do the two-step adverse action process, and you are not going to run afoul of any EEO laws or regulations. Negligent noncompliance is when somebody makes a mistake. Um, and again, we usually don't see these in the class context because somebody's damages in one situation are going to be very different than another person's damages. What we generally see, though, is willful noncompliance. And under the Supreme Court standard in Safeco, willful noncompliance means that somebody has to show that you had a reckless disregard for the law um, or that you knowingly were violating the law. In that case, the damages that are allowable are not only actual damages, but you can get statutory damages, and that's what everybody alleges. Statutory damages in the amount of between $100 or $1,000 a person. And there's not a lot of good case law about when it's $100 and when it's 1000 You can also get attorney's fees. Those are not the attorney's fees that um, you pay to defend the case, but it's the consumer or the plaintiff who gets their attorney's fees back, and then unlimited punitive damages. So the damages can be tremendously high depending on the statute of limitations. And the statute of limitations is the earlier of two years from when the person knew or should have known or five years. And what that really means is take a simple disclosure claim. Somebody alleges that the disclosure you're using is in violation of the law. And we're going to talk about what we saw in 2016 with some of the new theories of those claims. They can go back for up to two years and allege that there was a violation of the law and get statutory damages for that. If you didn't have a disclosure whatsoever, though, for example, a different story, they could go back for, for five years period of time, five years from the date of the actual consumer report, if you will. So the damages are potentially exponential in the amount. That's why it's so crucial to understand what's happening in the law and where we are with the trends in the industry. We're going to go to the next slide and talk about the seminal case and really the biggest development that happened in 2016, um, the Robbins versus Spokio case. Just as some background, um, this was a case that was filed in the Northern District of California. And the allegations were Mr. Robbins had data that was published about him by Spokio that he believed was inaccurate. It was generally positive information about um, his, his salary, advanced degrees, marital status, but it was wrong, and, and it was alleged to be inaccurate. And so he filed a case against Spokio alleging that they were a consumer reporting agency, and Spokio said, wait a second, help us understand what was his harm. He wasn't applying for employment. He wasn't applying for insurance or, or an apartment. How did the FCRA even apply here? And the court instead of taking a look at some of the arguments, basically what they said was, well, you're right, this didn't have, there's no allegation of harm, we're going to dismiss the case. It was then appealed up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals did their analysis and said, well, the statute allows for statutory damages, so there doesn't have to be actual damages or actual harm. There was then a split in the circuit. So you've got the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals saying one thing and other circuit courts of appeals around the country saying something different. So it went up on a writ of certiorari to the Supreme Court. This happened all in 2015. On November 2nd, I was lucky enough to be in the Supreme Court when they had oral arguments on this case. And then everybody waited. So now fast forward to the beginning of this year, 2016, when we're waiting for a decision of Spokio. And what we thought was going to happen is that the case would have been affirmed, where it said that you don't need to have any harm to bring standing in federal court. So let's talk about what the Spokio case really dealt with. It dealt with the fact of whether or not someone can sue under the Fair Credit Reporting Act in federal court if they haven't been harmed, if they haven't had 
an allegation of wrongdoing against them or haven't shown concrete harm, could they have standing to bring a case in, in federal court? That was the case and the question in front of the court. And so we thought that the decision was either going to be affirmed or it was going to be reversed. And what indeed happened was, unfortunately, as we all know, in the early part of 2016, Justice Scalia passed away. So now you have a court of, instead of nine justices, eight justices. So most scholars thought that it was going to be a tie and nothing was going to happen. We waited and waited and waited. Meanwhile, hundreds, if not thousands, of cases where there were claims under the FTRA were being stayed because the argument was, why should we litigate a case or why should we get a, an opinion of a federal court judge when the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, is actually going to rule on this issue? And most of the courts agreed. So hundreds and hundreds of cases were stayed until May 16th of this year. With half the year over, we came and we had a decision by the Supreme Court. What was so interesting about that decision is it didn't affirm and it didn't deny, it actually remanded the case. It sent it back down to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals saying, Ninth Circuit, you didn't apply this correctly. Um, and so go do it again. Let's go to the next slide. What was interesting, though, is that in the language of the opinion, there was a very long, um, well-written opinion that talked about the fact that there still needs to be particularized injury and concrete harm for somebody to be able to bring a claim. Um, the good news is now we have been arguing, employers can argue that this damage and this injury has to be real, has to be actual, and has to be particular. Um, and so it's a very, very good news on that. The Ninth Circuit case, the Spokio actual case that um, was remanded, actually had oral argument two days ago. We were lucky enough to send some folks over to, to watch that as well. Um, and what's interesting is it'll be interesting to see what happens with that Ninth Circuit uh, because th there was no harm that seemed to be alleged even after the Spokio Supreme Court decision um, on the oral argument. So more to come on that, and we'll certainly keep you abreast of that and, and keep up to date on what happened with the oral argument. So the good news is that since the opinion, we've had some decisions. We'll talk about that in a second. The bad news is Spokio case is not the silver bullet that we all thought it might be. The reason is because the Fair Credit Reporting Act allows somebody to bring a claim in either state court or federal court. That means it's got concurrent jurisdiction. So this case only deals with when somebody's allowed to bring a case in federal court. So what we saw in 2016 was a huge amount of cases that were originally filed in federal court that were dismissed and then refiled in state court, or cases that were filed um, in state court that then we removed as the defense bar up to federal court and plaintiffs were saying, no, you're saying there's no standing here, it can't be in federal court. And the problem with having these FPRA cases in state court is that oftentimes you're dealing with, I mean, you are dealing with a federal statute. Um, you've got judges that may or may not know the federal law. You've got judges who are elected, not appointed. And while that's generally a very good thing, if you've got people that have never heard of the federal law, um, and you could have mixed results, right? You could have somebody in Iowa dealing with a class of people who are all over the country. If you still have that exact same case in California or Florida or New York, you might get a very different um, opinion. So you might get inconsistent results all over the country um, that affects classes of, of individuals. We're going to go to the next slide. And I mentioned earlier that forum shopping was a really big deal. And, and this is exactly why. Because what we're seeing is people looking for the right forum, the right jurisdiction, where to bring these cases. Um, and again, we've got a lot of um, waiting time, I think. It's going to probably take about 6 to 12 months before the dust settles in, in some of these cases. Um, we'll go to the next slide. We've got really a mixed bag. Um, most of the cases that were pending under Spokio were disclosure and authorization cases. And we'll talk about what that means and why and some of the new theories that have developed while Spokio is pending and then after Spokio. Um, some of them were adverse action. At least we've got some good news that I'll share with you in a few minutes on the adverse action front. But there has been a mixed bag of cases. A lot of cases and a lot of judges have said, look, unless you can show some true concrete harm, it's not enough. Um, there's been 
a taking of this argument of standing, and many people have uh, applied it to different contexts. So, for example, not just the FCRA, but the TCPA and other statutory schema statutes. So if you've got a statute that has statutory damages, it could be applied just like that. So lots and lots of motions dismissed saying, what is your harm? Show me what's your particularized injury or concrete harm. So from that sprung a couple of new theories. Um, the first is a privacy injury. So what the plaintiff's counsels are arguing is that by giving a disclosure form that um, uh, for example, was not clear on its face or had extraneous information is the most popular type of claim that you were invading somebody's privacy by getting a background check about them when you didn't give them the proper notice that you were going to. Uh, what we've seen in many of the cases is that when there's no allegation, the person didn't know that a background check was going to run. I mean, in almost all of these cases, it's crystal clear that a background check is going to be run, and that's even in the notice, and there's no allegation otherwise, uh, the cases are getting dismissed. The other new type of claim we saw in 2016 was this allegation of an informational injury, saying that, for example, because the disclosure didn't have standalone language and it had extraneous information in it, there was a right to get information in a certain way based on the statute, and the individual didn't get the right um, information in the right format that they were supposed to get. Again, that has been um, denied in a lot of, of cases. Although, you know, for every, every three cases we get good, we get one bad on the employer side. In the past month, we've had a tremendous increase uh, of the number of cases that have been dismissed. So um, it's definitely getting to be um, a lot of momentum, um, although the, the end is, is not in sight. It, again, it's going to take probably six to 12 months before all of these cases um, get decided. And then the question is, are they going to be put on appeal? And if they are appealed, then it's going to go to the courts of appeals throughout the country. And then the question is, if there's a split in the circuit, it's potentially maybe ripe to go back up to the Supreme Court. What does that mean for the future? Well, obviously, we have a new administration. And with the election, we have now um, new cabinet members being um, potentially pinged every day. We've got a Supreme Court seat that is currently open, and President-elect Trump is likely going to try and fill that seat in short order. You also have a Supreme Court made up of justices, who many of whom are in their 80s. And if history shows us anything, um, it's a pattern that many justices seem to retire in their 80s um, based on, on past history. So that may or may not happen, uh, but there may be multiple open seats that the president will likely have impact in, in filling. And that, obviously, is going to have a big difference on what the different types of rulings are, depending on who is the justices on, on the bench at the time. So there's a lot of potential mix-ups that could happen with the new administration and looking forward to, to 2017. Although, frankly, this is going to take time. And so none of this is going to happen overnight. For the time being, we've got district court cases that go both ways. And so the, the litigation is not gone. I am very hopeful that in a year or two we can have another webinar where we say the litigation has thwarted. Um, but so far, what you saw in 2016 was a huge amount of unknown. So you had from January to May when nobody knew what Spokio was going to say. And what that really showed us was a ton of settlements. So you've probably seen in the news settlements in the you know, one, two, three, four, five, seven million dollar range, for example, um, in disclosure cases. And I think we're still seeing settlements, although most people are rolling the dice at this point, um, unless it's a very, very good deal for lots of other different reasons, um, because of the good case law that is coming down. It's not all good, so you should know that. And there were some bad cases that came out a couple weeks ago in Washington, D.C., but then we got some very good cases. Um, in other forums like California, we just got some great cases, and, and um, Missouri as well. So that's really what happened with Spokio. And, and it's going to impact the litigation that we're going to see throughout the remainder of 2017 and in the future. Let's go to the next slide and talk about the disclosure form issue and the disclosure form challenges. This is the area where we're seeing more and more litigation. and so. 
I don't want anyone to take away and think that, oh, because we've got the great case of Spokio and we've gotten some good um, after Spokio interpretative cases that you don't need to worry about your disclosure and authorization forms anymore. You absolutely still do. Uh, this is, again, the, the most common, this in adverse action, which we'll talk about in a second, are the most common claims that we saw in 2016 that we generally see um, in the FCRA world. Under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, an employer must, before it procures a consumer report on a potential applicant or employee, must give that person notice and a disclosure that it consists of a standalone document consisting solely of the disclosure. But then the statute says you must also get a person's written authorization and that the written authorization can be in the same form as the disclosure. It's very circular. Um, and so what we're seeing is it used to be that people would have one size disclosure form at the top, authorization at the bottom, um, and, and everyone went on their merry way. What we're seeing the trend in and what the best practice is is to separate the disclosure form from the authorization form so that you can argue that there's no extraneous information. Uh, we're seeing increased litigation in 2016 on um, a lot of these different requirements of what what equals extraneous or what is alleged to be extraneous information, um, and that the disclosure somehow violates the standalone document. Again, our biggest argument is, one, what's the harm? And two, remember, in order to show a class action, the plaintiff's counsel still have to show that an employer was willful, meaning they were reckless in their disregard for the law or they knowingly violated um, the law. And given sort of the, the differing of opinions from all of the different jurisdictions, it's going to be much, much harder to prove willfulness um, for most of these challenges. We'll go to the next slide and talk about the specific challenges that we're seeing to disclosure and authorization forms. Uh, the first one is the case where I think that if there's going to be willfulness proven or shown, this is going to be the area where plaintiff's counsels are going to make the, the biggest argument, which is when there is a release of liability in the disclosure form itself. And this case started back in 2012 with the Singleton versus Dominus Pizza case, um, went through 2013 with Reardon versus Closet Made, was pretty quiet. 2014, 2015, um, blew the lid off of this litigation, and there were hundreds of cases, and then even more so um, in, in 2016, all the cases that were waiting and waiting uh, based on the Spokio stay, for example, in many of those cases. So basically, plaintiff's counsels are arguing that anything that is not just a disclosure that a background check is going to be run and an authorization to do so could be deemed as extraneous. If you've got a release of liability, if you've got state law information, and there's about 14 states that have their own requirements, don't put those in the disclosure. Um, failing to provide certain documents, or if you separate the form, if you have a separate disclosure and a separate authorization, failing to give both of those. Um, information about getting credit reports when you're not getting credit. So understand that in addition to the Fair Credit Reporting Act, what we saw in 2016 was a huge impetus of ban the box laws that not only talked about when you can ask about criminal history, but really changed and modified the processes of, of what employers have to do with adverse action. Um, one of them was the New York Fair Chance Act that specifically talks about the fact that you're not allowed to say you're going to ask about credit when legally you're not allowed to ask about credit. New York City is, is one of the big, that plus um, Chicago, Illinois, and then 10 other states have uh, restrictions on utilization of uh, credit reports. Um, References to investigative consumer reports in the disclosure form itself, whether you're getting an investigative consumer report or not. In the employment context, an investigative consumer report is generally only going to be either a reference check or an employment verification that asks specific questions about eligibility for rehire or, or performance information. We're also seeing challenges when there's electronic signature um, or even things such as, for example, um, when the authorization allows law enforcement and schools and educational institutions to provide information, that that somehow is too broad of an authorization that makes it extraneous information. There's some very, very good case law that calls into question um, those arguments. But every time a case comes out, the theories are changing. So what do we expect to see in 2017? New theories on the horizon. Um, the plaintiff's counsel are having to be very nimble and coming up with new 
claims of harm and injury and new issues on their disclosure forms uh, that they're concerned about. But the good news is, for the time being, we've got a lot of good cases up our sleeve. We've got a lot of good decisions. Hopefully, in the next 6 to 12 months, we will see additional decisions coming down, um, and this will be a deterrent for plaintiff's counsels who are trying to bring these claims. Um, instead of getting easy money, um, hopefully we will see a difference in that. You know, what we used to see, and, and the other thing that 2016 brought was threat letters. So one of the things we saw was plaintiff's counsel, excuse me, plaintiffs who, before even going to get counsel, would go and apply at many different organizations. They would go through the interview stage, and oftentimes they would actually get hired. And after they got hired, they would have a background check run, they would have a start date, and instead of showing up on day one, they would send a letter basically saying, oh, I've, I've moved on with another uh, opportunity, thanks so much. By the way, uh, the copy of the disclosure form you gave me was in violation, and I am demanding $50,000 or I'm going to go sue you in an FCRA class action, it's basically uh, similar to extortion. Um, we saw this from a number of serial plaintiffs. Um, now more and more we see the same plaintiffs going and applying at many different companies just to allege this um, harm to get these damages or to, to be a class representative in a class action. So we saw this a lot happening in 2016. Um, hopefully we're going to see a decrease of that in 2017. If we go to the next slide, the next topic we're going to talk about is adverse action. Um, and I've got good news on the adverse action front that, that we didn't know if we were going to have, but now we, we really do have some good news here, which is, you know, people mess up adverse action all the time. And this is one of the other areas where we see a lot of lawsuits. And what the statute requires, just as a quick refresh, is that prior to taking any adverse action, you must provide the individual with a copy of their consumer report, with a copy of their summary of rights, the ability to dispute that information, and then any state law information. Then you must wait a reasonable period of time, and then you can give adverse action. So what happened in 2016 in legislation, um, and then we'll talk about the litigation. Well, the first thing is the legislation requirement, um, you know, there's state law rights that are required in some of those pre-adverse action letters, like New York and Washington have, have had information for a while that's been required um, Massachusetts and California um, have language that's required in the adverse action letter. But then you saw these ban the box laws in the last three years really come into play and change the adverse action and pre-adverse action requirements. So now in multiple jurisdictions, you have to state the reason why you are thinking about denying the person or uh, taking other adverse action on the individual. San Francisco, Seattle, um, Maryland, there's two counties in Maryland, Prince George's in Montgomery, Chicago, New York City, now you've got LA that was just passed. Um, there's a lot of uh, misinformation about the LA Bay of the Box Ordinance. Let me clarify that. Um, the LA Ordinance was passed but has not been signed by the mayor. Um, people are saying that, that it was signed uh, back in, in December or earlier. It has not. We confirmed this morning that law has not been signed by the mayor. Um, and it likely will be, but there will be no enforcement of that law until July of 2017. Better to get your ducks in a row and understand what the ban the box requirements are. Um, but that law in, in LA, very similar to the New York Fair Chance Act, requires individualized assessment of any sort of criminal history prior to sending the pre-adverse action letter out. And you actually have to provide those documents and your analysis to the individual, much like the Fair Chance Act. Um, the, the issue which is interesting in, in LA and in San Francisco, which is totally different and on the other side of, of the, the world and on the other side of the spectrum from New York, is that in New York City, for example, the New York Fair Chance Act says you're not allowed to tell a person um, that a background check is a condition of employment. You can't tell them any time before a conditional offer of employment can't be in the application, can't be in the interview, can't be in the job description. You are violating the law if you tell somebody that prior to conditional offer. Whereas in San Francisco and LA, for example, you must tell a person that a, if a background check is required and you must tell them that um, certain very specific language 
about the fact that it will not be um, it will not be a carte blanche decision and certain factors must be taken into consideration and they have appeal rights, et cetera. So it's very hard to have a one-size-fits-all perspective. It's also very hard if you're utilizing your background screening company to assist you with your adverse action processes to make sure that you are compliant. So what I would say is with regard to your responsibilities under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the disclosure form, the authorization form, the adverse action language, those are solely and wholly an employer's responsibility. The law makes very, very clear it is no one else's responsibility other than an end user, um, meaning the employer. So make sure that if you are having a third party assist you with this, that you know the language that's being used, that you have a way to build in providing the reasons, um, and that you're doing the correct thing with the timing. So New York City now requires three business days from the date of receipt of the letter. I don't know how you're going to get the date of the receipt, so you have to deal with that. Whereas the general regular Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act says a reasonable period, and that's been opined by the FTC to mean five business days. You've got San Francisco that says seven days, but five business days is generally always going to be seven days. You've got now um, Philadelphia is the, most, um, is the longest, which is 10 days. Um, and now you've got LA, which also now, when it goes into effect in July, will require you as an employer to keep the job open um, for a period of time. And may also have you do an additional analysis. So if you do the pre-adverse and somebody gives you more information, you have to redo your um, application of the factors under the EEOC. Um, and, and obviously, these are statutes and these are codified. They're not just guidance like the EEOC guidance. So a lot of things happening with the adverse action front, and it sounds very daunting. Um, we'll go to the next step. I'll tell you where we're seeing the most um, impact of this is, is this no good deed goes unpunished when, when what happens is you utilize a third party, for example, and um, somebody, um, for example, calls up the, the applicant to say, oh, by the way, you'll get something in the mail, but don't show up for work on Monday. And that that could be deemed to be an adverse action because the person hasn't gotten a copy of their pre-adverse, they haven't had five business days or the requisite period of time under the local or state jurisdiction you're in, and they haven't then um, had the opportunity to dispute and then get the adverse action letter. We're seeing a lot of that. Um, we're also seeing a failure to send two letters. We're seeing um, when you've got auto rejection with an applicant tracking system that sends out an um, an email saying thanks but no thanks. Nobody likes being told twice that they're not hired with a, you know, with the adverse action letter and then an email through the ATS system. So make sure to shut those off. And then lastly, we saw a, a new case in 2016 that called into question labels in your in your hiring system. So whether it be your ATS system, your applicant tracking system, or your HRIS system, or your background screening company system that you utilize and grade and score. Uh, people in, if you've got language that says that a person is ineligible or um, uh, does not hire or does not meet expectations or read or something like that, and that's just a signal to say send the pre-adverse action letter out, be careful. Um, because if that's the label you have, at least in one case, the court said that could be deemed enough to be determined to be an adverse action just by the label itself. So be very careful about that. Here's the good news on the adverse action front. There have now been three cases. Um, one was in um, California, one was in Minnesota, and one was in Missouri. The Missouri case was our case where um, basically the argument was that the pre-adverse action letter was not provided in, in a timely manner um, with, for one of these situations. And we were able to prove, and the courts in all of those three cases specifically held that if the background information in the consumer report was accurate, meaning there was no mistake, then that person didn't have any harm. Because remember, the pre-adverse and the waiting and the adverse is really due process. It's a way to give the person the ability to say, hey, wait a second, before you take action on me, there's something wrong, that's not me. Or that misdemeanor or that felony should really be a misdemeanor or that, that doesn't belong to me, for example. So they have the right to dispute the accuracy of the information. And if they could not dispute the accuracy because the information is accurate, 
then the argument is they had no harm from failing to get the pre-adverse and the adverse. So three really great decisions that came out in the last two months on that. Um, I think we're definitely in 2017 going to see a decrease in the amount of claims um, under the adverse action because of that. And that's really good news for everyone involved. Um, we'll go to the next topic before we, um, we've got about three topics to go to before we get to some questions here. Um, with regard to the next topic, workplace investigation exception, I mentioned this, this is not terribly um, concerning for anyone, but just to understand, uh, there is an exception in the Fair Credit Reporting Act that says if you are doing a workplace investigation of a current employee or you are looking to see um, if somebody is complying, a current employee is complying with local, state, or federal law, then you don't have to get the consent form um, for under the FCRA or follow the two-step adverse action process. It's an exception. And what the FTC came out in a blog post and said it earlier this year was, look, the exception can't swallow the rule. Um, it doesn't ever apply to applicants. So if you're not dealing with employees, then forget it. You don't have the, the exception. This is really meant to deal with regulated um, in entities and industries. And um, I would just say, be very careful about relying on this exception, especially now with the clarification from one of the regulators on this. The other big thing we saw in 2016, we'll go to the next slide, is ban the box. And we touched on this a little bit with some of the litigation, excuse me, some of the legislation with the um, ban the box laws and how it relates to adverse action. Um, the key, though, is that we saw in 2016 a huge increase in the number of ban the box laws both on the local level and on the state level. I think with the new administration in 2017, we're likely to see less at the state level, definitely less at the federal level, and likely more at the local level. Why? Because given the makeup of Congress right now and given um, the presidency, I think that ban the box is not going to be on the, the highest agenda. There's so many other things um, that at least as of this point could be on the box. We don't think that this is really going to be one of the, the hotter topics. But you'll notice that many of these ordinances were passed or went into effect in January, in uh, 2016. You've got about four or five that, that went into effect and we're going to see the trend continuing. You see the trend already with LA that again um, was just um, passed by council and now uh, will be signed into the mayor. We think, I believe the mayor has until Monday uh, to sign the law um, and, and we're waiting on that, but, but likely that's going to be happening uh, anytime soon as well. This is a trend that is continuing. If you have not looked at, I mean, obviously the adverse action piece, but if you've not looked at your application, if you've not looked at your criminal history questionnaire or what you're doing with criminal history, you definitely need to. There are now more private right of actions on this. We are seeing now that, that um, some of the laws have been in effect for a little while, um, beginning of this year, um, end of last year, for example, we're seeing more litigation on this and more regulatory enforcement action by the New York um, attorneys general, by other attorneys general, by, um, uh, for example, by um, other state groups that are, are looking at these and, and local local ordinances. I know Washington has been very um, vocal, Seattle specifically, in terms of its enforcement of, of its ban the box. Um, so understand that trend is not going away. We think it may go away a little bit on the state level, but likely going to continue for the foreseeable future on, on the state level. The other thing we saw in 2016 was a sweep of the industry. We'll go to the next slide. By the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. About every four or five years, the Federal Trade Commission does a sweep. It'll be interesting to see with the new administration what happens in 2017. Um, with the um, CFPB, there have been some questions about whether or not the agency will, will even remain in existence under the new um, presidency. but um, we're going to have to wait and see on all of those things. But suffice it to say, many of these investigations were in the gig economy, on-demand economy space. The FTC specifically was looking to see if the FCRA was being followed. Um, there's a, there was a big focus on background training companies, on accuracy, um, on certain certifications that they were getting. So 
So you might see a change in your ordering systems requiring you to promise more things or promise on a more regular basis. That's all because of um, the CFPB um, and the FTC um, doing all of these, these different things. So let's close out before we open it up for questions in a few minutes on the additional trends that we're likely to see in, in 2017. I think we will see some more guidance, um, either through publications um, or through settlement. The CFTB has been doing their guidance through settlement. The FTC has been publishing papers, although they don't really say much more than the law. We have begged and pleaded with the um, FTC to provide, for example, a one-size-fits-all disclosure form that they believe is, is comports with the law. Um, we don't think we're going to get it. We've asked now numerous times through different agency groups and industry associations, and we have um, not been able to get that. But, but we're still going to be asking, and I think people are still going to continue to do so um, to try and get clarity on that. Um, I think there's going to be additional investigations, and anytime there's investigations, there's a potential for lawsuits by the regulators. Um, we're also going to see more lawsuits that are going to be decided. So not necessarily more lawsuits being filed, but there's so many that are pending right now I think we're going to see some more, either they're going to be settled um, or, and no decision, or we're going to see some decisions coming out um, in 2017. So keep your eye out for those things. Um, Spokio, wow, we're going to have to wait and see what the, the Ninth Circuit does based on the oral argument of just earlier this week. And now, importantly, um, what's going to happen with all of the other cases out there? Is there going to stop federal litigation? Does that go to state litigation? We're going to have, you know, cases all over the country where we're litigating in state court. Um, and if that's the case, is there going to be some sort of policy argument that says that this isn't fair either? I still think we're going to see more plaintiff's counsels coming to the trend. Um, this is a very lucrative business for plaintiff's counsels because these are easy claims to bring. So I think we're going to be jumping on the bandwagon more and more. So keep your eye out for that. And then, of course, every time we think we understand and we get good opinions, then new theories come up, and the plaintiff's counsel has come up with something new um, to do employers on. That's not going to change. Um, and unfortunately, I wish it would, but, but unfortunately, I don't think it will. So that's what we have to look forward to um, in next year, 2017, and potentially um, years to come. We've got 10 minutes left, and we are going to open it up for questions now. I would strongly encourage you to utilize the um, question feature um, of the, the webinar, go to webinar program so that we can answer your questions in the few remaining minutes that we've got here today. And I'll turn it back over to Megan. I, I think you've been very thorough, Pamela. I haven't seen any questions come through. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if anyone has any in the next couple minutes, feel free to type them in right now. Um, otherwise, you can reply directly to your GoToWebinar invitation, um, and we will receive them and can pass them along um, to Pamela and answer them for you at another time. I'm not seeing any come through, so like I said, Pamela, I think you were very thorough today, and, and we thank you for your time um, and the presentation. And again, if you have questions, just reply directly to your GoToWebinar um, invitation or reach out to Easy Backgrounds, and we will answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today. Um, we appreciate your time. Thank Thanks, you, Pamela. everyone, and happy holidays.